Greetings today from Botswana. This video is meant for those of you who are trying to work for the Lord, desire to work for the Lord. Uh, perhaps you're a little frustrated or not understanding how God can use you or what's going on. Sometimes it seems like nothing is happening and we need to learn to trust in God. And that is what this video is really about. When my wife and I first came to Africa and we were called of the Lord to come over here, we were only called to flee the United States before it is destroyed. That is what we were called. That is how the Lord initiated the call through a very strong dream. And he led us over here first to Africa and then to Botswana. And as it so happened at the time of our departure in 2020, this COVID-19 thing was, was getting going. And it created a, a, quite a pinch. At the same time he had led us to leave, this, was, this thing was, was coming out and affecting the world. And it really affected travel and where you could go. And so as a matter of fact, at the time we left, the time that God has shown us to leave, we couldn't even get into Botswana. And we came to Tanzania first, then uh, a while later, it was Zambia for a little bit, and then finally Botswana had opened, and here we are. Uh, yesterday was our two-year anniversary of being in Africa. But the thing is, people were asking, what are you doing here? What are your goals? What's your purpose? And that wasn't an easy one to answer because everybody wants to hear something. They want you to have some definite goal. Well, we didn't come here as, uh, you know, backed up by a rich denomination or anything like that. We came because the Lord led us to flee America. Now, that didn't mean that we weren't going to, to minister or to preach or anything like that. But there was no plan and there were no connections. As a matter of fact, as it went on during the time we were making plans to come here, and that would have been a process so probably about six months after I had left my work and things like that. If we talk to people, any people along the way, we would tell them or I would tell them, you know, what was happening. It wasn't so that I was so uh, happy and sure of myself. The thing is, we didn't know anything. The COVID thing put everything in a pinch and we really had no uh, no basis. We had no grounding. We had no contacts to come to Africa. And I was hoping along the way, you know, God would lead someone to, you know, once I had shared that information, I may say, hey, I know something about this. Uh, however, that never happened. It didn't mean that God's hand was shortened. It wasn't. So I just want you to know it happens like that sometimes. We just have to, to understand we are following the Lord step to step, step by step. And the work is really his. And so this is what I have. I went through this. I listed a number of points. Again, I'm going to have scripture and more on this information in the description at the bottom. Please feel free to look it up. You remember in the book of Judges, perhaps, that Gideon was fighting the Midianites, that God employed him to do this. And at first, when Gideon was going to gather his army, that God, that God told him to get he had 32,000. Now, that's a pretty nice size army. Now, I have a feeling the Midianites were, were more than that. But God said, no, there are still too many with you, lest you should think that your own hand saved you. God is making it clear. We can do nothing without him, and the work is truly his. And I read this again. Again, from 2 Corinthians Chapter 3, verse 5, not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think anything as of ourselves, but our sufficiency is of God. We must realize this, you know, from salvation to maintaining the cause, maintaining the work of regeneration, you know, in our lives, all of this falls to the Lord. He has done everything for us. It is not our own hand that will save us or anyone else. What God wants is obedience, not sacrifice. He doesn't want us doing lots of great religious works that he hasn't authorized. We don't need that. That's works, not grace. But again, let's go on to the second point here. The second point I have is watching how the Bible de-emphasizes the work. It de-emphasizes it. 
here I see a great passage from, uh, I'll take it from Romans 9, 15 and 16. For he saith to Moses, that is God saith to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. So then it is not of him that willeth, nor of him that runneth, but of God that showeth mercy. It is not of our works. It is not some real go-getter that God is after. As a matter of fact, 1 Corinthians uh, 1, chap, uh, verses like 26 through 31 tells us God chooses the base things of the world, the foolish things of the world to confound the, the wise, because those foolish things like myself are dependent upon him, and we have to be at every turn. And of course, I always like also Isaiah 66, 1 and 2, where God is saying, where is the house that you, you build to me? Where is the place of my rest? All these things my hand have made. So some people might be really proud of the works they can do for God, but God is the one behind these superstructures. See, and all of these things come from me. You're not impressing me. He says, to this person will I look even to him that is humble and of a contrite heart and that trembles at my word. So there's a de-emphasis on our works in the scripture. We also look toward, uh, number three I have is that God is against busyness. In other words, people are always trying to keep busy. It seems to be a, a real goal. Oh, well, we're busy. Everything is going good. Well, it basically means you have no time to think or pray about anything in a lot of cases. Of course, if it is someone with their own business, legitimately, they might need business to, you know, to make a living and everything. But a lot of times it is just to keep every moment of the day filled or to say we're being physically active for the Lord. We must remember the testimony of Joseph from the book of Genesis and remember that he was in captivity then for 13 years. His brother sold him, you'll remember the coat of many colors, for 13 years before he was brought to Pharaoh and promoted. And it was 22 years until the dreams that God gave him were fulfilled. And so you can see there could be a lot of uh, waiting, but it just shows that God wasn't real interested in keeping Joseph busy. Boy, from the time he was 17 to the age 30, there would be a lot he could do in that time. But God wasn't interested in it. He was doing works on the inside of Joseph. And we would remember, as I look to it also, from, from Luke 10, 38 to 42, you might remember the story of Mary and her sister Martha, Now it came to pass as they went, he entered into a certain village, that is Jesus entered in, and a certain woman named Martha received him into her house. And she had a sister called Mary, which also sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. But Martha was cumbered about much serving and came to him and said, Lord, dost thou not care that my sister hath left me to serve alone? Bid her that she come and help me. And Jesus answered and said unto her, Martha, Martha, thou art careful and troubled about many things. But one thing is needful, and Mary has chosen that good part, which shall not be taken away from her. So this is another testimony against keeping busy and what seems to be productive. Then I look to this as to waiting for God. Oh, there are so many scriptures of waiting for the Lord. There are a lot. One of the, one of the main ones is from Isaiah 40, verses 28 to 31. You may look that up at your leisure, but the one I'm going to read to you is from Luke 24, 49. So this goes right. I, I like to keep both Old and New Testament examples. So you'll see there is a consistency in the word. Jesus said, And behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you, but tarry ye in the city of Jerusalem until ye be endued with power from on high. In other words, he was telling his disciples to wait for him until the Holy Ghost had come. This was after the resurrection. So again, you see there's something to waiting for God, for his timing. Don't proceed forth without him. And uh, we need to take these things very seriously. Again, I encourage you to look at uh, these scriptures in the description uh, for our help. Now, one of the main things that goes, the next point is, it's the view of others. One of the main things about this whole process if we're trying to think, oh, am I, you know, am I doing enough? 
Maybe I've missed something. Maybe I should be doing this. Maybe I should be doing that. Well, that comes down to we're comparing ourselves with others. That's really what we're doing. Uh, we may not think we are doing that up front, but we are. We have this from 2 Corinthians 10, 12. Simply says, we dare not make ourselves of the number or compare ourselves with some that commend themselves, but they measuring themselves by themselves and comparing themselves among themselves are not wise. And as we see at the end of that chapter, it says, not he that commends himself is approved, but whom the Lord commendeth. That's really what it's all about. It comes down to what are others thinking of us? And so we're comparing ourselves with ourselves and especially as members of the body of Christ, we all have different functions. And so we shouldn't be quick to do that and just keep everything in prayer and trust of the Lord. John 7, 24, Jesus says, judge not according to appearance, but judge righteous judgment. That is, people should not be just looking at appearance. I mean, appearance can say an awful lot, but it doesn't always say everything. And so we should be careful to take the time to look a little deeper. Another thing I wanted to point out was prayer and Bible study. This is point number six. Only too often, if you're engaged in prayer and Bible study, people think you're not doing anything, or you may feel, you may feel like you're not doing anything. But this is foundation. This is what we need. We need the knowledge of the Word, and we need the power of the Holy Spirit. We need God working to show us the way. We should not be proceeding forward unless he has said this. In Acts chapter 6, verses 2 to 4, you know, Peter testifies, it is not fit that we should leave the word of God and, and wait tables. They were talking about the, I think it was the Greek women were not being ministered to in, in the daily, for their daily needs by the body and body of Christ. Well, Peter and the other apostles weren't going to do that. They were going to keep their noses in the word. There is something more important. Now, they did take care of it, but the point is something is more important, and that is scriptural. That is prayerful. You are doing something when that happens. And just as a, another piece, I'd read this from Galatians. This is Paul testifying, Galatians 1, 15 through 19. Well, I think through 18, I'm sorry. But when it pleased God who separated me from my mother's womb and called me by his grace to reveal his son in me, that I might preach him among the heathen, immediately I conferred not with flesh and blood. Neither went I up to Jerusalem to them that were apostles before me, but I went into Arabia and returned again unto Damascus. Then after three years I went up to Jerusalem to see Peter and abode with him fifteen days. So what was Paul doing for three years? Guess what? He was studying the word and he was praying. He had a lot of misunderstood things in his philosophy. He knew the word of God very well, but he needed God to speak to him alone through his word. He went away for three years. He wasn't keeping busy to be recognized in doing works for God. God picked him and he took the time to teach him. And it is very important. There's something else that's also from the book of Galatians. And I just want to say this. When we're trying to keep busy, when we keep trying to push ourselves, we are running a risk. And that is the book of Galatians was written to those who were in danger of falling back into a works-based salvation. We need to avoid this. But listen to what it says in chapter 2, verses 16 to 18. Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ, even we have believed in Jesus Christ that we might be justified by the faith of Christ and not by the works of the law, for by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. But if, while we seek to be justified by Christ, we ourselves also are found sinners, is therefore Christ the minister of sin? God forbid. For if I build again the things which I destroyed, I make myself a transgressor. See, when we're living by the law, that is, we're trying to oppress God with, by our works, to do those works, we must be perfect. We cannot violate the law in any point no matter how minor, or we are guilty of all. That's the testimony of the Bible, which is why we need the grace of God through Jesus Christ. 
And so is a real temptation to fall back into works, you see. But it's much better to wait, to pray, to seek God, to find out what he wants for us before doing anything. If your heart is sincerely going after God, he will put you to work in his own time and in his own way. May God bless this message to you.